Um, it's pleasure to meet you all. I'm Dr. Brian LaCour um, from uh, Applied Research Laboratories, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and I had the Center for Quantum, Quantum Research over here at ARL. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. You should have permissions now. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, we're good. Okay, so you, so you guys can can hear me, see my screen well. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, okay, so um, I know you guys have been deep in in Kiss Kid and and all that. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, a little bit more physicsy stuff, um, and uh, in particular, introduce you to um, a um, simulation tool that we use for simulating experimental quantum optics. So uh, first, a little bit about myself. So um, I run the Center for Quantum Research. This is a research unit that's under ARL. We're relatively new. We've only been here uh, since 2015. Um, you can see now the picture below is a snapshot of my group. This was pre-pandemic um, when we could all get together uh, without masks on. Um, uh, so quick, we got staff quick interruption. And, I I think yeah. we can't see this slide. All we're seeing is uh, the PowerPoint thing. We're not seeing the actual presentation. Is that true for the rest of you as well? Yeah, yeah. We're just seeing the oh. first slide. Oh, okay. now, now we're seeing the third slide, the fourth slide, but it's. Okay. Uh, yeah, but it's, but, but not in slideshow mode. No, no. Okay. Hmm. That's odd. I wonder why slideshow is not working for us. All right. Well, try, that's fine. Try okay. unsharing your screen and then. Uh, share your screen again, and this time do whole screen, the whole screen sharing. So instead of just a window, try doing the whole whole screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have the option of yeah, doing the whole screen. You should be seeing exactly what I'm seeing. Is that right? Yes, we're looking at the second slide, not in slideshow mode. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, now we're seeing presenter mode. If you, uh, there should be a switch displays uh, option. Uh, maybe yeah. try display settings under display settings. The drop down in the top left. Yeah, you know, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do it like this. Uh, all right, but... that's all right. Okay. Um, so there's really not much in this um, I having in selection mode. Um, okay, so um, some of you may also know um, I'm also the personal investigator for Person Research Initiatives uh, Quantum Computing Stream. Uh, I know there are a couple of folks in the hackathon who are part of that stream. Um, and uh, this is a program that we run every year starting in the spring, and it runs from spring to fall. Um, we, so it, it's a, it's a year-long program. Kind of in the spring, we focus on some quantum basics and uh, focus on quantum information and um, applications like quantum communication. Um, in the summer, we have uh, an optional program where we do experimental quantum optics. We have an optics lab uh, up in my place on the research campus. Um, and then we also have, in parallel, a virtual version of the experimental program, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, and then in the fall, um, we finish up uh, focus on algorithms and computing and uh, making extensive use of, of KISS-KIT. So the stuff that you're probably familiar with as part of this, this hackathon. Um, and um, for those of you who are um, considering um, uh, uh, participating in this, um, this program is now open to non-FRI students. So if you're interested in learning more about it or have a friend who would be interested, just let me know. Um, and then one other thing that um, is a relatively recent development uh, we spearheaded an effort to 
uh, to put together a new certificate program in quantum information science. So this is available to all uh, UT students um, starting with um, this um, past year's um, course catalog. And um, it consists of um, six hours from either the FRI stream or uh, taking uh, uh, Professor Anson's course, and then 12 hours from a variety of physics, computer science, and math courses. Um, for most um, for most majors, your degree program, you'll probably need maybe one or two extra classes to satisfy this certificate. Uh, so if you have questions about that, you can contact me or um, Professor Craig Sitz in the physics department who actually runs the certificate. Uh, okay, so um, what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is um, this thing called the Virtual Quantum Optics Laboratory, or VQL. Uh, this is a, an online uh, simulation tool that was developed back in the summer of 2019. Uh, it was developed by a couple of students of mine, um, uh, including some folks from the upper eye stream. And it was meant to be uh, complementary to our experimental quantum optics lab. So the idea was to have a tool that you could build quantum experiments uh, with and explore um, uh, how, those, uh, how those experiments would work out um, and include some realistic aspects. So it's not just an idealized simulation. Um, so it's a bit of a sandbox. You, you know, you can, you can kind of build whatever you want. Um, it is available online uh, at uh, vqol.org. Um, you can log in under your Google uh, Gmail account or just as a guest if you're, if you log in through Google, then you, it'll, it'll save your experiments. Um, and then it has a bunch of different components that you can kind of mix and match and place on a big optics table. Uh, one of the unique things about Beeple is that it's actually an entirely classical implementation of quantum optics. So um, you'll see a bunch, you know, you saw on the, the title slide there, um, all these little dancing colors. This is actually randomized polarization from uh, the way that we treat vacuum modes as, as real galaxy noise. Uh, also, the detectors that are used for uh, single photon detection are deterministic devices that will trip whenever the amplitude goes above some threshold. Um, so keep that in mind as you're looking at some of these experiments. All right, I'm going to go through a couple of examples, um, and then if we have time, we might uh, walk through a few. Okay, so first of all, um, I presume everybody's familiar with what a qubit is, right? Um, and there are lots of different ways you can represent it. Mathematically, we represent a qubit by a pair of complex numbers, um, if you like, normalized. And um, one way you can realize that um, physically is in terms of polarization of light. So uh, light is an electromagnetic wave. Uh, that means that um, along its direction of propagation, there's an electric field that's oscillating. Uh, there's also a magnetic field that's oscillating in an orthogonal direction. And we refer to the polarization as the orientation of that electric field. So in this particular example here, we would say that this electric field is, is vertically polarized. Um, in general, you can represent polarization um, in terms of the portion of the uh, field that is, that is horizontal and the portion that's vertical. Um, these numbers can also be complex and that complexity um, defines the relative phase of the electric fields horizontal and vertical components. And when they're out of phase, that can lead to circular or uh, elliptically polarized light. Um, so this is basically a qubit without the normalization. Um, in VEQL, we represent polarization by colors uh, because that's easy to do. You know, of course, real light, um, the uh, color of, of light is different, is determined by the wavelength. Uh, but as visual aid, we use color for polarization. Um, this is an example of a simple experiment that illustrates Malus law. Uh, Malus law is a relationship between 
the intensity of light and polarization. And here we have a setup where we have a laser that's producing, in this case, horizontally polarized light, and a polarizer that's oriented to um, a certain angle, and then a power meter that reads the, the light. In this particular case, the polarizer looks like it's set to um, probably 45 degrees. And so it converts the horizontally polarized light to diagonally polarized light, but it also attenuates the light and it uh, calls off those cosine squared of the angle. Um, you can also um, look at Malice Law in terms of a polarizing beam splitter. So this is a device that will transmit horizontally polarized light and reflect vertically polarized light. Uh, and, and then you can use a device, just a half wave plate that acts as a unitary transformation that rotates the polarization without changing the power. And then the power gets separated into those two components and you can see how they vary. Uh, so these are, these are some of the basic things that you can use. Polarizer in mathematical terms is like a projection matrix. Half wave plate acts as a unitary matrix and these polarizing beam splitters are a way of separating out the components, following vertical components of your light. Okay, so that's that's just classical light. Um, if you want to go to class to uh, quantum light, then you can introduce uh, what's called a neutral density filter. So this is really just um, a little smoky piece of glass that strongly attenuates the light. Um, it's uh, parameterized by an optical density D that tells you basically how many powers of 10 you reduce the, the light intensity by. Um, so you're going from relatively bright light on the order of a few milliwatts down to things that can no longer be measured um, with just simple power meters. Um, but you can perform similar kinds of experiments you pass the light through a polarizing beam splitter. And now instead of using uh, power meters, you can use uh, these single photon detectors. Um, and so if we think about this mathematically, um, we have a quantum state that we're trying to represent, uh, which is characterized by a coherent state. So coherent state is, is like, a, it's like a classical wave, but with quantum noise. Um, and this is a separable state, including the horizontal and vertical part. We can represent that by a Jones vector where we just add the stochastic noise on top of it. So this is a mathematically equivalent representation of this quantum state. Uh, the one over square root two factor comes from uh, the ground state energy of a harmonic oscillator. So one half h bar omega so square root of that. Um, and these are standard complex Gaussian uh, random variables. The detectors, as I said, they work based on an amplitude threshold detection scheme. So they will click when either the horizontal component of this Jones vector or the vertical component falls above some, some threshold uh, gamma. And so that also will define um, a dark count rate because if you turn the light off, this term goes away, but you still have the quantum noise part, and that, um, that can still give rise to detections. Uh, so this is how each detector works. It looks at the Jones vector impinging upon it, and it makes a detection on that one, and then, um, and then you can correlate across them. Um, if you want to know more about the details of the mathematics behind how we do all this, uh, there is a paper here that you can refer to. You can, off the archive or it's available um, through open access. Okay, um, so as I said, this is a representation of quantum mechanics um, that is intended to represent the real world um, and not sort of the idealized uh, quantum, quantum world. And so we can look at how this um, matches up with what we see in reality and what we would predict for the Born rule. Uh, if we take the simple example of the uh, Born rule where we have um, uh, light that we're rotating polarization for uh, by some angle theta, we would expect that the probability 
should go as cosine squared theta. Uh, basically, it's just proportional to the intensity according to Mel's law. And then we can look at, um, so then one question is, how do you define probability when all you're measuring is counts? Right? You want to make some connection between those two things. Um, and so um, one common way of doing this would be to take the counts that you have and you basically normalize them. So you look at the minimum number of counts, maximum number of counts, and you renormalize and rescale. This is an important point because we don't actually measure probabilities, we measure counts. And so you have to take into account the data analysis process when you are comparing the in theory. Um, once we have that, then we can look at what happens as you say increase the optical density. And at the same time, um, we're also um, increasing the detection thresholds, making the probability of dark counts lower. And what we see is that as we change those two things, uh, the red here shows the actual probability based on counts. Uh, the black is the Born rule probability. And as you get to this regime where you have very, very weak light um, at a very high threshold, it matches the quantum prediction almost exactly. So you can think of this as like a poor man's uh, single photon source. It doesn't produce single photons, it produces weak light, but it behaves like single photons um, when you get detections. Okay. Um, now, in addition to lasers, we also have an entanglement source in vehicle. Uh, and the entanglement source is modeled as a multi-mode squeeze state. Uh, this is how we produce entangled states in the laboratory. So mathematically, you might know an, an entangled state as something that looks like this. It's say um, uh, uh, a um, left and right photon, and you have either horizontal and horizontal or vertical and vertical, and maybe there's relative phase in between them. Um, as a multi-mode squeeze state, what's actually produced in the laboratory is something that looks more like this. Um, we have here a random vector representing the right light beam and the left light beam, and then the different polarization states for each of them. Um, and then we have these random variables that uh, represent the vacuum state and these uh, hyperbolic sine and cosine functions um, that represent the squeezing of the vacuum. And then you see that they're kind of mixed and matched so that parts that are on the right are um, involved parts on the left. That gives rise to correlation. Um, and then the phase um, uh, comes in, in, in there as well as a relative phase. So if you look at this um, in an experiment, we have an entanglement source here. And we have two polarizing beam splitters. So those separate out um, horizontal and vertical components and then matching detectors. And you'll see things like here when Alice measures a horizontal, Bob also measures a horizontal. When Alice measures a vertical, Bob also measures a vertical. Um, it's more subtle than that, of course, um, but that's kind of the basics of it. Um, also, you get lots of non-detection events and you can get single single detection events. So um, it's not as simple as, as, as uh, just perfect correlations. Um, okay, and if you want more info on that, you can check out um, this, this, this paper here that goes into the map in a little more detail. Okay. Um, when we run this uh, summer program, there's a number of experiments that uh, we have the students look at. Um, and this is just an example of some of the things you can do with vehicles and the things that we can study. And I'll, I'll show a few examples of these. Um, so I don't know, I kind of broken these up into the way of the single photon and the way of the entangled photons. Single photons might seem more boring, but you can do hyper entanglement where you have a single photon that has multiple directions and multiple spatial modes. And that can be used to define a multi qubit state. So, with single photon states, um, you can actually do an optical version of the Deutsch Jose algorithm. Um, Matt, uh, you guys are familiar with that. Um, you can build a Mach center interferometer and study wave particle duality. 
Um, and you can also implement something called a Wheeler's, Wheeler's, um, Wheeler's delayed choice experiment, uh, which is based on a Moxinger interferometer. Um, with entangled sources, you can do a lot more crazy stuff. Um, you can build a quantum eraser, which is basically the Wheeler's delayed choice experiment with, a, um, with an entangled source swapped out for a regular laser source. Um, uh, you can do photon anti-correlation experiments, a uh, Hungle Mandel effect where photons go into a beam splitter and then come out one direction or the other. Um, quantum entanglement, entanglement swapping, which is used for building quantum networks. And uh, of course, the Bell CHSH inequality violations, which are used to verify entanglement. Um, quantum state tomography is um, one of the things that we have the students start off doing because it's a it's a basic um, tool uh, to use for analyzing states. This is a typical kind of experiment. We'll have a laser neutral density filter and then half wave and quarter wave plate, um, which together can be used to prepare an arbitrary um, polarization state. So you can think of those as like in Kiskit, there's the the U gate or what used to be called the U three gate. Um, these two things act like that, so you can compare any, any qubit state you like. Um, and then uh, another pair of quarter and half wave plates that can be used to rotate your basis. Uh, so you can measure in different bases and then polarizing beam splitter to do the final measurement analysis. So this acts like in Kiska, this would be like a like measurement gate that would give you a zero or a one. Um, and so from there, you can do, you can, um, you can measure in different bases. And so um, typical experiment, you would measure in say the horizontal, vertical, diagonal, anti-diagonal and right, left circular bases um, to measure Z, X and Y respectively. And that gives you a density matrix. This is a picture of one example of it and you can get Pretty good fidelities if you choose your parameters right. Okay. Um, and then I mentioned before an optical version of Deutsch Josa. So Deutsch Josa is a uh, is a simple um, and in its simplest form, it's a it's a two qubit quantum algorithm. It's originally designed by David Deutsch to illustrate how quantum computers um, can um, can use quantum parallelism. And um, this is an optical version of it where we'll take our laser to be initially in a two qubit state where it's traveling to the right and it's horizontally polarized. We'll call that a zero zero state. It goes through a half wave plate that rotates the polarization from horizontal to vertical. So it acts like a knot gate on the polarization state. It goes through a beam splitter, which then splits it into right going and down traveling wave that acts like a Hadamard gate. Um, and then we have here another um, pair of wave plates uh, that act on the polarization that rotate the polarization from vertical to uh, the green here it indicates anti-diagonal. Uh, so that acts as a Hadamard gate on the polarization qubit. Um, and then to implement a C knot, uh, it's very simple. Um, on the part that is traveling to the right, so we take the direction as the control qubit, nothing happens. But on the part that goes down, uh, we'll take that as, as a one. Uh, that's the, 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 when the, when the control qubit is one, then we simply apply a knot gate on that, on that branch, and that implements a knot gate for the whole thing. Um, this represents our, uh, our unknown oracle. That, have this be a knot gate in this case. And then the final step, we apply Hadamard gates again to, um, to the left qubit, the polarization qubit, and then Hadamard gate to, um, to the, the other qubit state, the spatial nodes, and then do measurements. I do measurements on, um, and then uh, we see that uh, one of them lights up and that indicates that it's a balanced function. Um, you can take this and make more elaborate multi-qubit implementations by taking the light and splitting it up into multiple branches. 
Um, every time you double the number of branches, you add another qubit. Obviously, this gets pretty cumbersome, but um, this is a way that you can visualize how, uh, how quantum parallelism works. Okay. Uh, I mentioned Hondo Mandel effect. This is another um, important effect in quantum mechanics, and it's something that's used as a tool in a lot of optical um, protocols. So, the basic idea here is we have an entanglement source here that's producing um, beams of random polarization. Uh, so, that's the multiple colors here. And then we feed them into a beam splitter. This is a, a regular. Um, non-polarizing 50-50 beam splitter. Now, the theory says that if we put two identical photons into a beam splitter, that they will, they will both come out of one end or the other. You will, you will never see them come out separately from, from, each, um, from each output port. Um, and so um, what that means is that um, for an entangled um, light source, um, what you get on, on the output port kind of depends on what the entanglement source looks like. In this case, we're going to um, use a type two uh, parametric down conversion source that prepares a psi minus state. So uh, also, I guess in atomic circles, we call a singlet state. So it's a combination of HV and VH. Uh, with with relative phase, um, so they're not identical photons, and the Mandel effect predicts that you'll get them coming out. But the way that they'll come out um, is going to be such that um, you have certain signatures of what happens um, when you when you get this state. So on the analysis side, we have our polarizing beam splitters. Um, transmission is horizontal, reflection is vertical. And when Beeple runs, it will spit out a list of all of the detection combinations you have. This is an example of this, where you see that, um, well, first of all, there's, there's a lot of cases where only one detector clicks. Um, that's not supposed to happen theoretically. Theoretically, you always get two. Uh, but this is the way the real world works. Um, you can chalk that up to, to uh, detector efficiencies or just uh, the way that it's, that it's implemented. Um, more commonly, you'll get two detectors clicking, but you'll see that certain combinations happen more often than others. In particular, one and four and two and three happen quite a bit. So that corresponds to horizontal, vertical, right? Or vertical, horizontal, which makes sense from this, from this particular state. And the other combinations hardly ever happen at all. Um, the few counts that you do get are probably due to spurious star counts. So when we see a signature like this, that one and four light up or two and three light up, then we say, oh, okay, that means we have a psi minus state. But as you can see, that doesn't happen all the time. It only happens some of the time. In fact, it happens quite rarely. Um, but if you're looking for two detector combinations, um, it's a good comp it's a good indication of that. Okay, this is a basic tool that we can now use for other uh, types of experiments, uh, including quantum eraser. So quantum eraser um, is a variation of a Mondesender interferometer, and the basic idea is this: if you focus on this part here, we have uh, we have an entanglement source that's producing light. It's going into a beam splitter, and that beam splitter is splitting, splitting the light into two branches. That's kind of like what we saw with the Deutsch Joseph thing. Um, and then on one of them, we're going to have a halfway plate. And initially, we'll just set that to zero so it doesn't do anything. It's like an identity. Uh, technically, it's a Z gate, but it doesn't really affect anything. Um, then we have a phase delay here. Um, which you could implement physically by putting a piece of glass of variable thickness um, into the beam. Um, so that delays the whole thing. It basically applies a global phase, but only to that branch of the light. Um, and then mirrors redirect it back into a second beam splitter. And then we have detectors that are set with uh, behind polarizers that are looking for horizontally polarized light. Um, 
if if there's no halfway plate, no phase, no phase delay, um, and we have horizontal light going in, then we would expect horizontal light to come straight out here. Uh, the beam splitters, you can think of it as a Hadamard gate and then another Hadamard gate, and they basically cancel out. Okay. If we take the second Hadamard gate out, the second beam splitter out, then we would actually get uh, what looks like the superposition of the right and down modes, and you would see the detectors clicking um, with equal frequency. All right. Now, um, with the phase delay term, you get kind of an interesting effect that happens where as you change the phase delay um, with this beam splitter in place, you go from getting all horizontal to it gradually kind of changing. And as you change the phase delay, you'll actually see the number of counts you get, number of coincidence counts you get on one and two um, varies sinusoidally with that phase delay. Um, if you include this half wave plate here, this now changes the polarization on one of the one of the branches. And what that does is it acts to uh, provide a kind of which way information. It tells you something about this branch that's different from this branch. And when you look at it on the detector side, you see that that amount of information um, can actually destroy the interference pattern. In fact, if you crank the half the half wave plate all the way um, to 45 degrees, such that it would flip horizontal to vertical, um, then you see that the, the interference pattern is completely destroyed by this. Okay. The idea of the quantum eraser is now a variation on this, where we take this entanglement source and now for the other beam, um, we're going to measure it in the diagonal basis. And we're going to look at what happens when we get a detection on here and then also get a detection over on this side. So you can think of this detector as heralding the presence of a photon over on this side. And what you find is that when you do that measurement and you condition on uh, this particular detector making a, a detection, because it's in the diagonal basis, you've now mixed up any polarization information about what's going in. And you can actually recover uh, the interference pattern. You basically can erase the which way information provided by the halfway plate by making a remote measurement on the other side. Uh, so this is the idea of a, of a quantum eraser. And people think of this as being kind of spooky because you're doing a measurement over here and it's somehow affecting the interference patterns over here. But um, what this reveals is that what you're really doing is conditioning on a, on a subset of particular instances where the light happens to be more diagonal on this side, so it's more diagonal on that side. And that's the reason why you can give the interference pattern back again. Uh, so that's a fun experiment. And uh, I have a paper on that that goes into a lot of detail and you can also check out. Um, and then finally, quantum teleportation um, is the last kind of protocol that we can look at. Um, this is something that um, many of you may be familiar with in terms of how to build these things, quantum gates and all of this. Um, this was originally done as an optical experiment, and this is an example of how you can do it optically using VQL. Um, so uh, we need an entanglement source, a source of entangled photons, call that Charlie. We need um, something that produces an initial qubit state. So we'll, we'll call that Alice. She has a laser neutral density filter, and then some wave plates to prepare a given uh, qubit polarization state. Um, Bob, over on his end, is just um, doing detection of that teleported state. So all he's doing is some measurements to verify that the teleported state is correct. And then over here, this is where we do um, a, a Bell state measurement, which you may recall is an important component of that teleportation protocol. And here we're using the Hongo Mandel effect um, to do that. So we look at, for a particular polarization uh, result. In this case, we're measuring for horizontally polarized light in both detectors. When we get that, then we can say, uh huh, uh, we have an entangled state. So we have entanglement now between Alice and Charlie. 
that creates entanglement between uh, uh, with with uh, with Bob and the state the house produces is now um, uh, mirrored by what Bob sees. So if you look at this in VQL, again, it's going to be a long list of different combinations of different detectors. Um, and again, this is representative of what you see in, in the real world. A lot of times things don't work. Um, uh, so a lot of times you'll get just a single detector clicking. That's no good. Um, you may get two detectors clicking, but if, you know, that may be these two, but maybe Bob misses something, or maybe Bob sees something, but you didn't have a successful Bell state measurement. So what you really would like to see, you look at the cases where one and two click, that means we have a successful Bell measurement. And then we look at Bob and see what happens. And Bob has set this up in this particular experiment so that he's measuring in the same basis that Al was prepared in. In general, Bob won't know that, but let's just suppose he's trying to verify. Okay, in that case, we would expect that he should get all detections here and none here. And what we see is that under those conditions, um, most of his detections are uh, on three and very few are on four. That indicates that the Bell state was, was measured properly, the teleportation protocol worked, and Bob also successfully detected it. Um, and then um, kind of the, the um, one of the simpler but also most exciting um, experiments that you can do with entangled source is the Bell CHSH inequality. So um, this is a famous inequality uh, that um, was originally derived, well, a variant of it was originally derived by John Bell um, and later refined uh, by Professor Horn, Chimney, Holt. And um, it's used uh, in, as an experimental tool to verify entanglement. So uh, the experimental setup is pretty simple. We'll again start with the type two entanglement source that is uh, representing this uh, sine minus state. Um, I have a note here that we use a squeezing parameter 0.9. So this is one of the parameters in VQL that defines how strong the squeezing strength is. Um, basically how bright the pump light is. And then we're going to measure using halfway plates in different bases and use our polarizing beam splitters. Uh, so these are like measurement gates and then a unitary gate to measure on a given basis. And then we'll look at anti-correlation events here. Um, so again, we have lots of combinations of things that can happen. The things that we're interested in are cases in which Alice gets one detection and Bob gets one detection. Okay, so that's these events right here. One and three, one and four, two and three, two and four. And we see that vast majority of the cases, we get either one and four, indicating horizontal vertical, or two and three, vertical horizontal. Um, and then we can measure the correlations between these different events by just counting up um, all those different results. So um, uh, in this particular case, we have a negative correlation of minus six, uh, minus 0.68. You do it for other combinations of um, bases um, that are designed to give you a maximally um, uh, of maximal violation, and um, you get something that's very close to the quantum ideal. Um, the inequality says that this value should be less than two. That would correspond to classical non-contextual state, um, and you can get uh, higher values. Um, the reason you can get higher values is because uh, these detectors do not have perfect detection efficiency. And um, the model illustrates that the fair sampling assumption is, 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 is not valid. Okay. Um, that's kind of my, 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 my quick overview. Um, you can try this out yourself. Um, going to um, eqlol.org. Um, I'm going to pause for any questions, and then since we have a little bit of time, uh, I, I can go through uh, a couple of examples um, running in Lana. Any questions from anybody? 
I have uh, uh, one thing to ask. So this laboratory manual, would it be possible for you to uh, email that to me or uh, Michelle so that we could share it with the whole entire participant base? I can drop my email in the chat. Mm -hmm. I had one small technical question on slide eight. Um, there, there was a tensor product, and I was a little confused by it. Um, product that was a tensor product. On, I'll, uh, um, I'll hang on. Is that right? Yeah, take a second. Yeah. So on slide eight. This is this is what you're saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was confused why that's a tensor product instead of like a, a linear combination of some. Uh, I guess mm -hmm. I've never worked with optics before, so I'm a little confused. Is it not the case that uh, can a single beam become as many qubits as you'd like? Is that how this works. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so these represent coherent states, and um, a coherent state is actually a superposition of several single photon states. So a, a single coherent state is actually a superposition of a zero photon vacuum state and one photon state and a two photon state all the way up to infinity. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's That's for one mode. And then if you have another orthogonal uh, mode, then um, that's a whole other space. And so um, this would live in the tensor product of those spaces. Okay, I think that makes more sense. Anya, um, you're welcome to go ahead to your uh, demo, unless anyone else has questions, go ahead. This is also, by the way, why you can use a coherent light source like a laser as a single photon source. If you make the light weak enough, that superposition of all those different photon number states is approximately just a superposition of a zero photon state and a one photon state. So if we if we ignore the non-detection events corresponding to vacuum states, then we have something that looks like a single photon state. But um, I call it a poor man's single photon uh, state because it doesn't actually produce just single photons. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna let's see. I'm just sharing my screen right now. So if I pull up the screen, you guys can see this, right? Yep, okay. we can see it. Okay, so um here's an example of equal here. Um the blank slate. And um, I don't know, let's just do something fun. And we'll do an entanglement source here. Um, and so entanglement source by itself, if you just run it, it's producing all these random colors. These random colors correspond to different polarizations. And I've listed here six, but actually internally, it's a continuum of polarization states. So it's not just, just random realizations of these six. Um, so the colors kind of run, run the whole gamut. Um, and so what that represents is um, different random polarizations that although though they look totally different, they're actually correlated. So they're correlated, um, not perfectly, but in kind of a subtle way. Um, okay, so from that, we can now add in, um, let's put in, Polarizing beam splitters. And so these will act like our, our um, measurement gates when we combine them with detectors. So you can just kind of drag and drop components. And then um, if you highlight a component and press R, you can rotate it. Or you can also change the orientation here. And uh, please feel free to kind of play along as I'm doing this.
Okay. Um, so the entanglement source that I've set up here, um, it's a type one source. A type one means that it's HH plus VV. So the polarization should be positively correlated. Um, you can define a relative phase between them. That won't really affect the, the correlations and just measuring the HV basis, but it will give you the difference between like a, like a phi plus and a phi minus state. Um, you can also set it up so that the output directions are different. So I can do like up and to the right, which is sometimes convenient um, if you want to get the beams going in a certain direction. Uh, but I'm just going to use the standard left right here. Okay. And then let's see how this works. I'm going to put this in step by step mode. So we're going in time increments. Um, by default, vehicle works in time increments of one microsecond. So the assumption is that the light stays coherent for a full microsecond. And that's the time over which the detectors will usually uh, need to reset once they've detected. So every microsecond, you either get a detection or you don't. And then um, it goes to the next. So you see what will typically happen is that nothing happens. And then so one, one example here, Alice got a detection, but Bob didn't. And that happens quite a lot. Um, so instances like that, we would, you know, you would use that to measure efficiency. So, but then every now and then we get a double detection. And when we do, it's usually the case uh, here we get vertical and vertical because the, the lights reflected in both cases. Um, and going on, there's horizontal and horizontal. And that gives us a um, way of um, seeing the correlations. Now, those correlations by themselves could be classical. Um, just having your light um, such that you know, two things are, are correlated, that, that's, that's not really special. Um, to get a true quantum effect, you would need to look at measuring them in different bases. And so we can do that with F-wave and plates would be the simplest way to do it. So these half-wave plates rotate the polarization like a unitary gate. And so they're defined in terms of an angle. Um, with an angle of zero, they act like, like a Z gate. All they do is change the vertical component to minus sign. And that won't affect anything here. If we change the angle to uh, 45 degrees, so what it does is like it'll 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 change it to, to twice that angle. So if it's horizontal, it'll change it to vertical. Okay. So if that's the case now, our, our type one detector where, where we had um, positive correlations, we should, we should now see anti-correlations. This is correct. And so now go through, look for detection events. Okay, well, that can happen too. So everything lights up. We have now a particularly bright source. And there we go, single detection, but not, not, a, not a match. Another single detection without a match. Okay, so now we have one where we get one on each side and they're anti-correlated, horizontal on the side, vertical on that side. So that shows that the effect of this halfway plate was to form a gate operation, and effectively performed a not gate operation. And so it flipped the state that we're preparing from uh, from a, a, a phi plus day to a, uh, a psi plus day. Okay. Um, any, any any questions about that? Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's see. Let me look at some more exotic things. If you wouldn't mind, I, I think there's a way to share these experiments. I, can you, because there's an upload feature, would it be possible for you to uh, share some of these example uh, VQual circuits? Yeah, so if you go, so for, first of all, if you go to VQual, um, if you just sign up uh, for it for the first time, 
you'll see that there are three example experiments here that are like preloaded. And so one of them is actually an entanglement experiment. It's basically the one that I just showed you uh, without the, the half pipe lights in place. Um, and the other, the others are, I mean, there's the, the Born rule. This was an experiment we showed earlier where you have either a polarizer and a neutral density filter or halfway plate and neutral density filter. Um, let's see, you can study things that way. Um, I'm going to find something a little more exotic. Um, I can do teleportation. And so this is the, the teleportation experiment that I was mentioning earlier. So now we can kind of see how this works. Um, and let's see. Uh, what do I have this set up to? And how exactly do you view those counts that you showed in your presentation? You had a list of counts. Uh, good, good question. Um, that's shown at the end of the experiment. What I'm going to do to, just to speed things up, um, I'm going to put this in offline mode so it won't show the animations, but it runs the whole experiment and then it spits out the results. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, by the way, um, so the experiments, uh, there's a there's a text editor version of them. You can pull up and you can see there's, you know, this was like the original interface we had before. It was all text-based. Um, but one of the things you can do with it is, um, I think I have it. You can actually use JavaScript within the experiment. So this is a so it's just a, so it's a simple example, but um, you you specify JavaScript. You can have loops and such on the outside, and then inside you can set up your experiment. This is just placing a laser in one place. It's not doing anything too exciting. Um, but uh, we use this in some of our experiments to. Um, loop over lots of different parameters and such. Um, this is an example of the quantum eraser experiment that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So, um, See that right now we've set it up to where we have maximal which way information. We've set our halfway plate to 45 degrees. So you get if you if you it's hard to, to see this experiment because you have to kind of walk through all the different phase angles to see the the um, the interference pattern. Um, but uh, the way that it's set up, uh, this which way information is providing maximal information about which which uh, polarization you're, you're using. Um, and you can see this uh, maybe a little more easily if you put in if you put in an old fashioned laser. And then you can see how you get which way information so that one side comes out horizontal, one side comes out vertical. And then what comes out of the beam splitter is actually a diagonally polarized and an anti-diagonally polarized light. So they're actually, they cover um, all four possibilities equally. Um, whereas if I get rid of that which way information, then all the light gets recombined. So this is a wavelength behavior of light. Um, and 
you can also see that what the what the quantum erasure is doing is basically conditioning on cases in which the light looks like it's diagonal. And so if the light's diagonal, and we go back to that which way information, then it actually recombines and um, cancels out. And now we see that we're back to the case where we have that, um, that, that uh, uh, interference information. So the, the quantum eraser is really doing nothing more than conditioning on events in which you have what looks like diagonally polarized light. Okay, well, I think I'm out of time, but hopefully that gave you a bit of a flavor of stuff you can do. And um, yep, uh, there, there's one question in the chat, if you don't mind uh, staying a yeah. couple minutes extra okay. just to answer. Sure. Uh, Sarvesh um, asks, uh, why was there random light coming out of the uh, bottom of the beam slitter going into detector two? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's a subtle one, but a very important one. Um, so um, when we look at these beam splitters, although um, like this beam splitter here, right, it has one input port that's not being, being used. And you would think that that means that there's nothing going in, but actually you have vacuum modes that are always entering in. And so although it's not illustrated graphically, there's a vacuum mode coming into here and there would be a vacuum mode going into the other one, but it, it's already filled with the stuff. So when you're looking at um, the light coming out, so the one example we had where um, you had vacuum light coming out this way and then uh, horizontally light, horizontally polarized light coming out that way, that was simply illustrating the vacuum component um, that is present um, in that other outgoing beam. Um, so it's always there. And uh, in equal is just illustrated for you. But you would, you so would you see just... that as basically, um, it would look like there's no light there or you would get a few dark counts coming in in that direction. Uh, so that's just like noise on the machine. Does that make, is that correct? Yes, the, the vacuum, vacuum field is like a permanent background noise. It's a, it's a permanent feature of, of, of on a world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, hopefully all of you will find uh, VQL useful in your quantum projects. All right. Thank you and good luck on your on your